the payment splitter library provides functions that allow us to split Ether payments among a group of accounts. The sender who sends Ether to this uh, uh, contract that uses this library need not know about the splitting aspect, so it is sender agnostic. And the splitting can be done in uh, equal proportions or in an arbitrary manner. And this is uh, done so by assigning a particular number of shares to every account. And that account can later claim an amount of Ether that is uh, proportional to the percentage of the total shares that they were assigned. And this follows the pull payment model that we have discussed earlier, which is uh, much safer from a security perspective than a push payment model. The time lock controller library provides uh, library functions for enforcing time locks. Time locks are nothing but time delayed operations. If there are uh, operations that need to be executed only after a certain window of time delay has passed or occurred, that is referred to as time lock. This library provides uh, various functions to enforce time lock on uh, only owner operations. Only owner here refers to the modifier for access control, which when applied to functions, allows only the owner of that smart contract to execute that function. And this becomes really critical from a security perspective because uh, only owner operations are used in smart contracts to make uh, changes to critical parameters of that protocol or project. They're also used uh, on functions that enforce or change access control for that smart contract. So in all these scenarios, if uh, we want to give the users who interact with the smart contract an opportunity to notice these uh, operations that are making these critical changes and then decide if uh, they would like to continue engaging with the smart contract or if they would like to exit from engaging with the smart contract by removing the funds from the smart contract or uh, uh, some other logic, then time lock becomes really useful uh, for providing a mechanism to do so. So this library provides uh, various functions that uh, help us uh, schedule, delay, execute, cancel such operations or uh, do so in batches, all in a time lock specific manner. There are also functions that uh, let us query if uh, an operation is pending, if it is ready, if it is already done in the context of uh, the time lock. And one can also update the delay that is uh, specific to the time lock operation. Recall that we talked about the context library earlier that provides support for what are known as meta transactions. This ERC2771 context library provides a variant of that library that's specific to ERC2771. I would encourage you to take a look at this ERC if you're interested in the details. At a high level, there is a transaction signer who originates transactions by signing it from an externally owned account and sends the signed transactions to a relayer off chain. And this relayer is responsible for paying the gas. ERC2771 specifies uh, a secure protocol for a particular contract to accept such meta transactions. And uh, this protocol is concerned about uh, the gas relayer from forging, modifying, or duplicating the requests that are sent by the transaction signer. And so it specifies four different entities. There's the transaction signer who signs and sends the transaction off chain to the gas relayer. The gas relayer receives these transactions and is uh, expected to pay for the gas and then forward it to a trusted forwarder contract on chain, which is uh, further responsible for verifying 
the sign transaction to look at uh, the nonce and the signature and make sure they are uh, correct. And then finally, forward that verified transaction to the contract that is the ultimate destination for the transaction. So this protocol is uh, defined by the CRC and the uh, library provides uh, various functions to help with it. The minimal forwarder library provides support for implementing the trusted forwarder that we discussed uh, in the context of the ERC 2771 meta transactions. It uh, implements a very simple minimal forwarder that verifies the nonce and signature of uh, the forwarded uh, transaction before calling the destination contract. And it does so with uh, two functions, the verify function for uh, verification of nonce and signature, and then the execute function for uh, executing the specific function on the destination contract. Open Zeppelin provides support for uh, different libraries that help with uh, proxies. At a high level, the proxy setup requires uh, two contracts, the proxy contract and uh, what is known as the implementation contract. The proxy contract receives the calls from the user and forwards it to the implementation contract. And this forwarding is done via delegate call. And in this setup, the proxy contract is typically the one that holds uh, the contract state and the implementation contract is the one that implements the logic. So when the forwarding is done via delegate call, the implementation logic executes that logic on the state held in the proxy contract. As you can imagine, this has to be done in a very careful manner because it can lead to a variety of security issues. There are uh, many, many articles that have been written on this topic uh, by Open Zeppelin and also by Trail of Bits and other uh, security firms. So I would encourage you to take a look at those aspects while analyzing uh, contracts that deal with proxies. We will also take a look at uh, this proxy and the security implications in the security modules. So coming back to this particular library, it provides uh, a fallback function that uh, forwards the call to an implementation. It also provides uh, a delegate function that uh, allows one to specify the delegation to a specific implementation contract. This also allows us to specify a hook via the before fallback function that gets called before falling back to the implementation. The ERC-1967 proxy library helps us implement what are known as upgradable proxies. These are upgradable because uh, the implementation contract that sits behind the proxy can be changed to point to a different implementation contract. Recall the proxy setup where uh, the application state is uh, held in the proxy contract and the logic may be implemented in the implementation contract. So if you want the logic to change for whatever reason, maybe to fix a bug in the current implementation or to enhance and add more logic, upgradable proxies are uh, one way to do so. So in this case, the address of the implementation contract that can be changed is uh, stored in uh, the storage of the proxy contract and this specific storage location is uh, specified by the EIP so that it does not conflict with uh, the layout of the implementation contract that sits behind the proxy. The address of uh, the logic of the implementation contract can be specified as part of uh, the constructor and uh, the address of uh, the new implementation can be provided while upgrading using the upgrade function. So upgradable proxies are something that uh, we encounter commonly in uh, smart contracts and this again has to be done in uh, a very careful manner because it can lead to security issues such as uh, the storage conflict that is specified here. 
Another proxy related library is the transparent upgradable proxy. This uh, helps one implement a proxy that is upgradable only by an admin. It specifically helps us mitigate the risk due to attacks from selector clash. And what this means is uh, that if a function is present both in the proxy and the implementation such that uh, their selectors, their function selectors clash or uh, they evaluate to the same value, then that could lead to problems because uh, if there is a function call to that function, then uh, it will not be clear if uh, the function should be executed in the context of the proxy contract or if it should be forwarded to the implementation contract. So this library specifies that all function calls coming from uh, the non-admin users will be forwarded to the implementation contract even if those calls match the function selector of uh, the proxy contract. Similarly, the function calls made by the admin users are uh, restricted to the proxy contract. They are not forwarded to the implementation contract. This allows for uh, clean separation where uh, the admin functions are restricted to the proxy contract and non-admin functions are forwarded to the implementation contract. So the admin can uh, do things such as upgrade the implementation contract or upgrade the admin address itself. The proxy admin library is uh, meant to be used as uh, the admin of the transparent upgradable proxy that we just discussed. It provides support for various functions that are required by the admin. And these include uh, the get proxy implementation, which returns uh, the implementation contract address, the get proxy admin, which returns the admin address, changing the proxy admin, upgrading the implementation contract pointed to by the proxy, and finally the upgrade and call function that uh, both upgrades the implementation and then makes a call to that new implementation. The beacon proxy library allows one to implement a proxy where the implementation address is obtained from a different contract known as a beacon contract. And that beacon contract itself is upgradable. The address of uh, the beacon contract is uh, stored in the proxy storage at a slot specified here. Again, that is specified by EIP 1967. The constructor can be used to initialize uh, where the beacon contract is located. There are functions that allow us to get the address of the beacon, the address of the implementation, and finally to set the beacon contract to a different address than what was initialized. The upgradable beacon library provides support for implementing the beacon contract in the context of the beacon proxy that we just discussed. The owner of this contract can uh, change the implementation contract that this beacon proxy points to. And the initial implementation contract is specified in the constructor and the owner is the one who deployed the contract. There are functions that allow one to determine what that implementation contract is and also to upgrade it to a new implementation. The clones library helps one implement what are known as minimal proxy contracts as specified by EIP 1167. In this case, all the implementation contracts are uh, clones of a specific bytecode where all the calls are delegated to a known fixed address. And the deployment can be done in a traditional way using uh, create or it can be done in a deterministic way using create2. And corresponding to these two deployment options, there are two functions. There's the clone implementation function that uh, clones that implementation and returns the address of the instance deployed using create. And there is uh, the equivalent version for create2, the clone deterministic that uh, takes in the implementation and a salt and returns the instance of the clone that was created.
The initializable library provides critical functionality that is uh, required for applications that work with proxy contracts. Recall that in the proxy setup, we have a proxy contract that forwards all the calls to an implementation contract. The proxy contract maintains the data or the application state and delegates the calls to the implementation contract, which implements the logic that works on the application state maintained by the proxy contract. So in this setup, if uh, there are functions in the implementation contract that need to work with uh, certain initialized uh, values, then all such initialization should not be done in the constructor of the implementation contract because that constructor would modify the state of the implementation contract, which is uh, never used in this setup. So all this initialization is uh, expected to be moved to a different function which is typically called the initialize function that has an external visibility. And uh, this initialize function is expected to be called by the proxy contract. And this aspect of uh, not using constructors for initialization, but uh, using a separate initialize function applies not only to the implementation contract, but to all the base contracts that it derives from. And this initialization should be performed only once and should be performed immediately after the implementation contract is deployed, either from a deploy script or from a factory contract. The initializable library provides an initializer modifier, which when applied to this initialize function, allows that to be called only once. So these concepts of uh, the proxy setup and uh, the fact that uh, the implementation contract should not be using a constructor but instead an initializable function that needs to be called immediately after deployment and more importantly needs to be called only once are very critical from a security perspective. There have been multiple vulnerabilities reported because of uh, this not being followed, multiple exploits and something that uh, therefore needs to be paid very careful attention to. We now move on to a different set of libraries provided by the DAPSYS teams at uh, DAP Hub. These uh, are used commonly in smart contracts as an alternative to the Open Zeppelin libraries that we have discussed. The first one is the DAPSYS DS proxy. This implements a simple proxy that is uh, deployed as a standalone contract and can be used by the owner to execute the code, the logic that is implemented in the implementation contract. The user would pass in uh, the contract bytecode along with uh, the function call data. The call data we call that it specifies the function selector of the function to be called along with uh, the arguments for that function. And this library provides a way for the user to both create the implementation contract using uh, the bytecode provided and then delegating the call to that contract and the specific function and the arguments as specified in the call data. There are associated libraries related to DS proxy that help implement uh, a factory contract as well as uh, some caching mechanism. DAPSYS provides a DS math library that uh, provides math primitives for arithmetic functions. The first set of primitives are uh, arithmetic functions that can be safely used without uh, the risk of underflow and overflow. These are uh, equivalent of uh, the safe math library from Open Zeppelin. This has the add sub mul functions. There is no div function because the Solidity compiler has uh, built in divide by zero checking. DS math also provides support for fixed point math. It introduces two new types, the what type and the rate type. The what type is for decimal numbers with 18 digits of precision, while the ray type is for uh, decimal numbers with 27 digits of precision. There are uh, different functions that help one operate on the what and rate types as shown here. 
The DS Auth library provides support for developers to implement an authorization pattern that is completely separate from the application logic. It does so by providing an auth modifier that can be applied to different functions. And internally, this modifier calls the isAuthorized function that checks if the message sender is either the owner of this contract or the contract itself. And this is the default functionality. And this can also be specified to check if the message sender has been granted permission by a specified authority. And we'll talk about this aspect of authority in the next slide. The DS Guard library helps implement an access control list or ACL or ATL. And this is a combination of a source address, destination address, and a function signature. And this library can be used as the authority that we just discussed in the context of the DS auth library. This implements a function can call that looks up the access control list and determines if the source address can call the function specified by the function signature at the destination address. So it's a combination of the source, destination, and the signature that determines the value of the Boolean that's either true or false. When used as an authority by DS auth, the source refers to the message sender, the destination is the contract that includes this library, and the signature refers to the function signature. The DS roles library provides support for implementing role-based access control. This is something we discussed in the context of uh, the Open Zeppelin access control library as well. In this case, it implements different access control lists that specify roles and associated capabilities. It provides a can call function that uh, determines if a user is allowed to call a function at a particular address by looking up the roles and capabilities defined in the access control list. RBAC is implemented via three mechanisms. There is a concept of root users who are users allowed to call any function regardless of what roles and capabilities are defined for that function. There's a concept of public capabilities that are global capabilities that apply to all users. And finally, there are role specific capabilities that are applied when the user is not a root user and the capability is not a public capability. Let's now talk about wrapped ether. Protocols often work with uh, one or many ERC20 tokens, either their own or of other protocols. They also work with uh, ether that is sent to their smart contracts via message value. Instead of having two separate sets of logic and two separate sets of control flow within their contracts, one to deal with Ether and the other to deal with ERC20 tokens, it would be very convenient if we could have a single logic, single control flow to deal with both Ether and ERC20 tokens. The wrapped Ether concept provides this capability. It allows smart contracts to convert Ether that's been sent to their contracts to its ERC20 equivalent, which is known as wrapped Ether. And this conversion is a process called wrapping. And the other direction of converting the ERC20 equivalent of wrapped Ether back to Ether is called unwrapping. And this is made possible by sending the Ether to a wrapped Ether contract which converts it into its ERC20 equivalent at a 1 is to 1 ratio. There are uh, multiple versions of wrapped Ether contracts. The most popular right now is uh, the wrapped Ether 9 contract, which holds uh, anywhere between 6.5 to 7 million Ether as of this point. There are also some improvements being done. There is a wrapped Ether version 10 that is more gas efficient than the version 9. And this version also supports flash loans as per the EIP 3156 standard. So this wrapped ether concept is something that uh, we 
often come across in uh, smart contract applications. Uniswap is an automated market making protocol on Ethereum that's powered by what is known as a constant product formula as shown here, which is X into Y is equal to K, where X and Y are token balances of two different tokens and K is their constant product. Uniswap allows liquidity providers to create pools of uh, token pairs and whenever anyone provides liquidity to either of the two tokens of the token pair, new tokens known as uh, LP tokens, liquidity provided tokens, are minted and sent back to the liquidity provider. This represents their share of the liquidity in the tokens. Uniswap is the most popular protocol on Ethereum currently for uh, swapping between tokens belonging to a token pair and a big part of that is because of the simplicity of the constant product formula as determined by the curve x into y is equal to k. Uniswap also provides support for uh, on-chain oracles. A price oracle is uh, a tool that allows smart contracts to determine the price information about a given asset on the blockchain. In the case of uh, Uniswap V2, every token pair measures the price of uh, the tokens at the beginning of each block. So in effect, this is uh, measuring the price at the end of the previous block that is uh, maintained within uh, cumulative price variable that's weighted by the amount of time this price has existed for the token pair. And this particular variable can be used by different contracts on the Ethereum blockchain to track what is known as uh, time weighted average prices or TWAPs across any particular time interval. Uniswap recently introduced their version 3 of the protocol which is considered as a big improvement over their version 2. And this improvement is specifically around the concept of concentrated liquidity. And what this means is it allows liquidity providers to provide liquidity for uh, the token pair across custom price ranges instead of uh, across the entire constant product curve x into y equal to k. And this brings about a uh, big improvement to their capital efficiency. This version of the protocol also introduces flexible fees across different values as shown here. And finally, for uh, Oracle support, version V3 introduces advanced trap support where uh, the cumulative sum, instead of being maintained and trapped in one variable, is now done so in an array. And this allows smart contracts to Query the TWAP on demand for any period within the last nine days. Let's now talk about Chainlink. Chainlink is perhaps the most widely used oracles and source of price feeds for uh, smart contracts on Ethereum. Price data and even other kinds of data are uh, taken from multiple off-chain data providers and they are put on-chain to create these feeds by the decentralized oracles on the Chainlink network. And Chainlink has uh, mechanisms for aggregating this data across uh, the various data providers. And Chainlink provides an extensive set of APIs for uh, working with these oracles and price feeds. So I would encourage you to take a look at uh, their API documentation because uh, this is something that is very often encountered within different smart contract applications on Ethereum. With this, we come to the end of the Solidity 201 module. We started this module by taking a look at the different concepts of inheritance in Solidity. We then looked at the storage and memory layouts as they map to various Solidity constructs. We then reviewed the biggest changes across uh, the most recent Solidity versions. 
And then we reviewed various libraries that are supported by Open Zeppelin and used extensively across smart contracts on Ethereum. We also took a look at the libraries from DAPSIS. And finally, we reviewed some high level aspects of the Uniswap and Chainlink protocols. So hopefully you now have a much better understanding of some of these deeper concepts related to Solidity. And when you review smart contracts, you'll be able to recognize these aspects and uh, reason about some of their security impact.